Welcome to our 49th AIM Learn Fast webinar of 2021 and our 123rd overall since we started this in March of 2020. And I've uh, been having a great time. These, uh, these webinars have been fantastic. Uh, uh, we're going to continue on doing them and coming up with some great topics. I hope that um, if anybody is out there that uh, is watching these uh, either live here today or, or uh, later on YouTube, that uh, you'll have my contact information at the end with our, with, our, with our final slide. I am looking to fill the calendar for uh, starting uh, in, in January of 2022. And I would love, some, uh, love to get some feedback on, on topics that we might want to cover. So uh, please give me your ideas on, on stuff that we haven't covered or stuff that we covered, but maybe, co maybe we want to do it again or a little bit differently or a little deeper. Uh, let me know, please uh, send me some emails and uh, we are starting to fill the calendar here in the next week or so to start filling January, February, March. So looking forward to it, uh, to chatting with everybody. Today we've got an uh, an interesting and, and an interesting guest and a, and a good friend that is uh, that we've been chatting quite a bit. Uh, we've got Kevin Wells from Formula Drift. Kevin is the is the competition director, and they do they use a lot of data in a lot of different ways. And I thought it would be really really interesting to uh, to chat with Kevin and and uh, and, and get a handle on uh, on that. And we're going to start off by talking a little bit about how they use it in the series. And then we'll, uh, I think we'll back that up with uh, looking at some data from, uh, you know, at least some screen captures, if not some live data from, from, from a car and, and how, the, how the end user uses it, how the racer uses it. So we're going to, I think that's where we're going to go today. It's going to be a great time. Uh, for those of you that are here, make sure you put your questions and answers in the question and answer box. For those of you that are watching uh, on YouTube later, all the links that we're going to talk about, uh, all the documents that we may mention that we are going to link to the live viewers. They will be down in the in the um, description box of the YouTube video. So anything we talk about here will also uh, will also be down there. So don't feel like you missed out on some links or some documents or anything like that. Uh, they'll all be available to you as well. Okay, the um, let's talk a little bit about Kevin. Let's introduce Kevin. Some of you may know him, but uh, Kevin is the Formula Drift Competition Director, and uh, he, he's been a motorsports racing official for quite some time, an experienced crew chief in. In, um, in Formula Drift. He's a three-time crew chief of the year before he became an official and 10 podiums, five wins, uh, a championship um, on the car that he was a crew chief on. So his first time being here and I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for coming, uh, Kevin. It's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you for having me, appreciate it. We're gonna have a good time. The, um, uh, we were chatting with Kevin at the PRI show over the weekend and, and, uh, and a little bit yesterday. Uh, Kevin has background as a as a as a racer. Obviously, before he got into the racing official side, not just as a crew chief on the, on drift, but also in the import drag scene. So uh, Kevin was involved with that with quite a bit. So Kevin's been a big uh, horsepower freak for quite some time. Obviously, because both of those sports are uh, are big power, right? So the, it's uh, and, and lots of noise and and lots of uh, flash and smoke and, and and all the cool stuff that makes uh, makes those two sports successful. Uh, give us a little bit of background of other, you know, some of the stuff we covered here, but is there a, some other things about you that you've been doing lately? Um, I mean, not really too much. As soon as I started becoming the competition director, it kind of took over most of my life. So going back and forth between uh, people in their car build questions and traveling to events. And prior to COVID, we did actually a lot of international events. So we would do our eight round series here and then do five rounds in Japan. And then we usually had three or four more other international demos. So it pretty much fills the calendar, uh, you know, 90% of the year once you start getting going. You are the competition director, but I've, uh, I've been to the events and I've watched it and uh, you are a man on the run from, uh, from, uh, you know, early in the week till uh, late on Sunday night. Right. So it's a, uh, yeah, the, ask you what else that you do is a, is a bit not fair because it is a you know, competition director job you 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 handle a lot of the tasks right so um yep not necessarily in the, in the tower just observing i'm i'm the more on the on the ground guy with everything between cones and car wrecks and tow trucks and yep kind of all the all the above catch all absolutely see when i when i see you you're you're, you're on the dead run your radio is going and it's uh it's uh, your, your weekends, I'm sure, go by fast. The, um, 
uh, what I'd like to start with is we've got a lot of racers here from from all over the world, and while all of us have heard about drifting and understand uh, you know the basics, but the uh, but but don't understand a deep amount of of how it got here, where are we at, you know, uh, just a little bit about the series background. Maybe you can uh, maybe you can give us just a little bit about you know, how did this thing get started and, and to become such a such a huge huge thing in the in the world. Well, it uh, it started in Japan and originated basically in the mountains of Japan. And then uh, the D1 uh, series in Japan is kind of what got it going and becoming more popular. And in 2003, our co-founders, Jim Lau and Ryan Sage, brought them over for a demo. And we did a demonstration at uh, Irwindale. And basically it took off from there. So they worked with Road Atlanta to pave that horseshoe that's after turn nine, I believe. When you come down the hill, there's a horseshoe before you go underneath the bridge. Right. So that was paved just for Formula Drift. So that's okay. the Formula Drift loop. So in May of 2004, that's where the first drifting event was for Formula Drift. And when did you get involved in uh, in the series as an official? Or um, an, maybe competitor first, I suppose. But Well, yes. As a competitor, I was there for the first round. Ah, I've been there for, since the start, huh? Yep. So uh, I was actually there from the beginning, um, accidentally uh, kind of got involved in fixing uh, some cars and started traveling across for the series. And then after, I guess it was 2011, um, at the end of that year, yeah, end of 2011 is when I went to go work for uh, formula drift and take this position as that position is it was it wasn't one of those things where they uh they, they couldn't handle you anymore as a competitor so they have to hire the 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 the, the, <laughs> the most rambunctious or the uh the, the guy that's cheating the most or whatever was it was it one of those deals kevin or how? no no not really <laughs> um, no it was just it was one of those things that it was kind of time for me i was trying to figure out what i wanted to do with things and um I guess it was kind of my goal was to win a championship and we won a championship in 2009. Mm -hmm. And then I was trying to figure out what to do. And we had a ton of second places in the championship. And so I went and did uh, some Baja racing and some stuff for in 2011. And then this opportunity came up and I was like, Oh, well, this is kind of different, maybe a different career path, move on a little bit and try something different. So we finished off that 11 season with a second place in the championship. And then I kind of moved on from there. Perfect. The, um, uh, and, and I've been to the events and, uh, and their, their spectacles, right They're They're very good for the social media side and the, and something is always happening and it's very fast and uh, interaction with the fans is just such a wonderful thing. All stuff that you have to, uh, to keep, uh, keep your head, your hands around, right. And, and understand and make, make sure work. So, um, you know, kudos to you for, for making all that work real well. The, uh, the series, how, how does, how do they structure it? We, we see, you know, either on social media or on TV or, uh, it, live when we go, but that's, that's the, the pro level, right. Uh, that's the, that's the, the guys that are out there trying to make, make a couple of bucks and put on the big show. Where is there a structure to formula drift where you, where you start off at a, at like a regional level or a local level? How does that work? How do we keep people get good enough to continue to drift up and end up into the to the big show? So we have Pro Am series, which would be our uh, feeder series, basically. Um, and there, I think we've got ten or twelve all across the country at the different some of the different racetracks that we actually go to have them, and some of the other ones are in other states. So basically, that's where the foundation gets done. Okay. So they start. Those series, usually the top three competitors get a Formula Drift license. And then basically they petition to come into one of the two classes, either the pro class or the pro spec class. So it's not a, it's not necessarily one of those that, hey, if you want to come, come. There's a, there is a path that, uh, that they have to kind of pass through to, under, to, to, to get up to that pro level. Right. Unless you have like a bunch of previous racing experience. Yeah. yeah there's, so there's we had there. J.R. Hildebrand, mm -hmm. the Indy car driver, Indy I believe. Driver. Yep. It's IndyCar. been a little bit. It is. Um, he basically got with the team and got set up. So we gave him a license because obviously 
you're a professional driver. Yeah, yeah. So if you have previous experience, usually we can get people in that way. Especially that you've had, and then maybe they go to a, a, a test day or something, and, we're, and then it's really not a problem, right? Right, yeah. As long as there's a petition process, we just make it happen. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so so we're a data data webinar here, right? That's what we <laughs> that's what we do. So the um, the question would be is, okay, you're, you're going along, you came in in, in in 11 as an official, were, were they using any form of data from the, from the uh, Formula Drift side? Certainly the competitors were in 2011 when you came up, but were they using anything in Formula Drift when you became an official there? Uh, no, we were not using any form of data at all. Any official kind of data? Obviously you're, you're watching maybe video, whatever, but, you're, but no data. Okay. Uh, why was it important to you as an official to start using data? What does it do, you know, not the nuts and bolts of it, but why did you think it was gonna be something that was successful for you? Um, well, I really wanted to implement data because obviously the more money that comes into a sport and the more professional it becomes and the bigger the teams are and the more advanced the crew chiefs are and everything, um, it's much more difficult to police things and use it as a technical tool. So that's why I wanted to bring it in was to try to control a little bit better, at least have a better grasp of what's going on, as opposed to just using video to try to determine, you know, tires. And, you know, our sport is different than a lot. We use different tires. Um, there's five different brands. So trying to regulate that, and we have a tire to weight rule that trying to tries to balance the performance of the competition. So trying to make sure items that we're trying to implement are theoretically working. And without data, that's very difficult. Yeah. So the, um, w when I go to other forms of motorsports that are spec classes that, you know, it's, uh, you know, they're always worrying about, you know, the amount of horsepower a car has, and they're trying to make sure that maybe they have dynos that they put them on it, or maybe it's, uh, you know, weight or, you know, scaling things or you know, whatever it happens to be right yours is um, the if I were to go chat with a crew chief outside of uh, you as a uh, as an official what what are the things that they think their competition is cheating on or, or working the rules really hard it's tires obviously you just mentioned is there other things that they worry about well you're only allowed to move I mean obviously we'll start at the engine the engines are open Okay. So that is 100% free game. If you want to run, you have to worry about. <laughs> right. And, and that was kind of the idea. You don't want them being, you know, 50, $60,000, two liters that are, you know, millimeter precision or, you know, actually less than that, but you know what I mean? Time bombs. Yeah. Right. Well, you don't want it just being super expensive on everything. If you want to run a V8 with twin turbos and a blower all together with nitrous, doesn't matter. That's all on you. Um, we regulate the rest. So suspension points being moved around outside of the limits that you're allowed to. Um, chassis bracing that you're not allowed to do, cutting up different, there's, there's all types of different things where you can put weight obviously in places that are lower in the chassis and that'll you know change the center of gravity and stuff. And there's certain things that we don't want you to do to make it be more like the car people are used to seeing, not a tube chassis race car. Perfect, because you have uh, factory back teams, right? And when they, when it, uh, when it looks like a certain model of car, the, I'm sure the factories want to want a little bit of that, right? And so you, you, uh, you, you try to make sure they stay at least resemble the cars that they came from, right? Right, and so it's relatable to the fans. If someone comes in, they're like, "Oh, hey, this is this is what I have at home," not this is a fiberglass body that looks like something that I kind of have. It looks like a Mustang, yeah. but it's not, right? The Mustangs look like Mustangs. The BMW looks like BMWs, the Hondas. Okay, perfect. Perfect. And then uh, other parts of the powertrain, the, uh, there's probably no gearing rule or anything like that. So there's the things there you don't have to worry about as much, I suppose. Correct. Yeah. Okay. I mean, uh, quick change rear ends are allowed. So they use those a ton, which they've stolen from the sprint car world, basically. Mm -hmm. So quick changes and then NASCAR transmissions are in a lot of the cars, just a, a four speed G force. Um, then the sequentials have caught on. So we have Hollinger's, um, the RTS 6XD. There's a pretty much open. We have a very wide range of uh, transmissions and drivetrains in the series. 
what I have noticed when I when I go to the event, while you don't have events every single weekend, right? I mean, there are a little bit of space, but you have you have travel in between. But what happens is, boy, when you start the day, things are happening in a hurry. So those good transmissions, that those strong rear ends, critical to make you know, to make the next round, right? They uh, you uh, they have to be ready to go. There is a there is some time to repair things in between, but it's uh, but it's minimal, especially as you get towards the end. I mean, it, things are happening in a real hurry. Yep. So. So uh, per, uh, technology is important to them. Okay, back back to the data piece of it. The um, how do you use? Uh, uh, let me jump up a screen. Here's a couple of, of, of maps that I know you provide the competitors, and they're they're in some of the the stuff that you provide, even the fans that show up. But here's a here's a here's a map of one of your tracks. Let's talk a little bit about how you actually use the data, right? What's important to you as a uh, as the sanctioning body that is that is taking care of this uh, explain what we're kind of looking at here on the upper left and then we'll talk about the lower right which i think most people probably recognize here on the on our webinar right so basically the drifting is a judge sport so it's not based on time it's not based on speed it's based on basically the vehicle's position and the angle it's at on the course so in that map on the upper left you leave the start line, you go into outer zone one. So that's what the OZ one means. So there's a yellow border along that whole section all the way down almost to that red mark. Mm -hmm. So that's where you need to be at angle and close to that wall. Then you transition into the outer zone two section, which has that way. So that one's on the same side of the course, transition back to outer zone three on the opposite side of the course. And then you can see on there, it says IC one. So that's an inner clip. And that's where you go by with the front bumper at angle. And then you wrap around back to outer zone four and finish. So that's how the course kind of runs. So you can see how it makes it up into multiple corners and kind of the relative position on the course is defined by that map. Because you're not really going to go from one section, you know, one outer to another outer without going through that right transition point. Mm -hmm. um, and what are, the red, see, what are the red marks that are here? Right. So the red marks that are there, are the areas where the drivers are allowed to basically visually desell. So at that point coming off, that's, I forget what the banking is at Seattle. That's Seattle. That's, that's one, probably that's one, one, two Monroe. So the, the oval track goes this way. So that's one and two. Right. So that's probably five, eight degrees of banking, something like yeah, that. Yeah, probably. Um, so they're going roughly probably 80, five or so in the middle and then probably and then start scrubbing from there so as they add angle and they start coming through towards that first red mark that's where they can actually start slowing down so you'll visually see the car slow down in that section as they're trying to not blast off the course going into the flat section for outer zone two so basically and it's the same for outer zone three because you have to slow down because it's a decreasing radius to that inner clip number one. And then the turn gets even tighter going to uh, outer zone four through. So we've developed basically a visual D cell channel in AIM. So we can verify that what the judges are seeing, they tell me what they saw and when it D celled. And then I basically took the time code, went back into data, tons of data samples figured out and that's what developed this channel that you see on the bottom right and you use solo two solo twos uh, and and uh talk about how you, you you've got a, you've got a whole uh tray of them right uh, as an organization you're getting ready to go to the track for the for, for the first race of the season how do you handle that you're handing them out to the to, to the teams what how do you mount them how do you wire them and uh and how do you assign them well, basically, once once the competitors register, um, I have 32 units. So this year we actually had 33 competitors. So I kind of had to pick and figure things out, but um, charge the units. We uh, in our tech process, I figure out what ECU you have and what speed you're running your CAN bus at, and then we have a data connector that's specified in our rules. So you plug into that and then I have can high, can low and, you know, ground and 12 volts. So I power the solo off of that. I get the ECU can signal off of that and all the data so I can bring in RPM and everything else. 
And then I just have a roll cage mount in a hose clamp and put it right on the passenger side door bar of, of the car and then just center it up and we're good to go. So we're not just getting the GPS date beta that based channels. We're getting, uh, we're getting data that is coming from the ECU as well for, for specific cars. And, uh, and once that, what, what something you said last night, and you may have uh, hinted towards it just now, but you, uh, a guy shows up and he's going to run the, run the season, you assign him solo number, whatever, and you get it all set up to, to receive their can data uh, through a four pin Deutsch connector that is there. So it's getting power and it's getting the can signal. And then that basically that solo is always assigned every morning and given to that car, put in the car and you're grabbing it when you need it and, uh, and putting it back as you grab data. So it's a one solo basically runs through the, uh, runs through the season with a car, which is makes your job a lot easier when it comes to that ECU side. Right. And another interesting note is when you go into the, you know, into the configuration on the aim, you can see how many miles the solo's gone. Ah, there you go. So that's always interesting. I can tell kind of if you did better that year because you've got more miles. <laughs> <laughs> that and and time, right? I think you can dig into the in there and get time as well. Yeah. So the um, uh, perfect. So we've got the solos we're sticking in there. And um, when you when you grab data and you begin to review it, you know, we've talked about how we got it in there, what what you're using. What, what do you start to look at when you when you bring down, you know, eight, eight cars at one time and you start to look at them sometimes more? What, what are you actually kind of using the data for as a as a as a technical compliance guy in this case? Um, well, it's interesting. I've actually learned a ton from the webinars because <laughs> for the most part. Um, speed hasn't really been a thing in drifting because it's not part of the criteria and it's not necessarily relevant. Um, as long as you're not really slow, which whatever that happens to be, yeah. but now I can see that. So that's very interesting because you can, I can quantify when someone's like, oh, th th that car's slow. Now I can see what that means in real life once it comes through. Um, so that's interesting. But for technical compliance wise, I use RPM and throttle position a lot. Just to see if everything looks like it's on the up and up type thing. If you have um, RPM traces that are very, you know, rounded over and ripply and stuff like that, that's kind of what I look for just initially. Or if there's any uh, pedal position on drive-by-wire cars that are different than the throttle position. I brought up a, a, a data slide that you you had uh, you had loaned me some data and we blocked out uh, the the driver and the car for uh, to protect the uh, innocent and uh, the uh, and I just brought up some data real quickly. Uh, j and what we're looking at here is a speed trace. You can see that it starts at zero, and uh, you know the driver has left left the line and, and the acceleration happens. And they don't. It's a, it's a little different than what we're used to seeing as. Uh, uh, maybe a drag race trace where it is hammered down from the word go. And that's the important part of the track, right? Where these, uh, often you're racing, it, it's a pair. We haven't talked about that very much yet, but it's two people out there during the, during some of the competition. And, uh, and they they go that first little bit to get themselves set up and then they, they do the lead follow thing. So it's kind of interesting to see here that the RPM is not, he's not using maximum power, you know, half throttle. And then it goes to full throttle, but not a ton of RPM getting this thing up through the gears and into the gear that they're going to make the run in. And then, uh, and then the, the full throttle stuff starts happening. And then uh, what I've also got here is of course, gear position and, uh, and, and a yaw rate. And I don't know what you use. We didn't actually chat about this, but I did see it in the data. So I, so I put it up here and what, you know, you have some scoring criteria that you do and it's uh, and, uh, and yaw and yaw and, and making sure you never go straight. And so there's some other things that uh, you use is this, Yaw angle, one of the things that you look at as well? Um, well, I have been spending a lot of time trying to calculate the actual drift angle. Mm -hmm. um, doing it with yaw on its own doesn't appear to be correct in all the formulas that I've tried. Um, a lot of that is also due to the banking. Well, it's two things, right? It, it, it just, it, I, I should have maybe made that a little clearer, but the our yaw angle is, is degree of change per second. It's not it's not that difference of, of how you're traveling versus the car, right? It is, it is the change. So as soon as the driver pops it up into being 45 degrees, 
the yaw angle, this this particular channel value will drop back down to zero, right? So it's uh, that's not fair to the driver, obviously. You know that that's a good thing. But you, I know you have been working on it. We're not ready to uh, to show some of that information yet. But but uh, you're working on it where you actually do get that 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 difference in the heading versus the yaw angle and get a number. So perfect. right. So yeah. So we've been been playing with roll pitch yaw calculations, lateral G calculations vectors all types of things and, and, and all sorts of things right trying to get something uh pulled together because yeah i look at yaw rate kind of like as like g you you kind of get it and then it goes away on its own you know it, it fades out it doesn't and incrementing the yaw rate doesn't necessarily work right either it kind of uh i guess increments errors so it kind of wanders off into space a little bit um so yeah, it doesn't seem to work quite right in 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 our sport, anyways. So you're still working on it, and yes. um, and but it is a it is a factor of it. But the other thing that happens is number one, the cars are really sideways. But number two, the, the, and you already mentioned it, but the banking, and you're coming off and onto banking, and of course that affects uh, affects that. So that's uh, that makes some sense. You're still working at it, and uh, and I know we're, uh, we're we're doing our best to help you and uh, and do some other things. So uh, we did have a questions related to that. Uh, maybe we just chatted about it, but maybe you can just uh, throw just a little bit more into it but uh, bzm31 asks how do you measure the drift angle we just talked about that a little bit if you measure it directly which channels do you use to create that math channel yeah i know we're working on that and you're probably not ready to to discuss it fully but uh, uh, any more you could add to what we just kind of chatted about on that question um the most luck i've had is using um basically vectors of lateral acceleration okay perfect that appears to be the one that brings it the most together. Otherwise, the vector of roll pitch yaw is another one that's very similar, but they all have their their drawbacks, I guess. Right. The um, uh, we're going to look at this data a little bit more in a minute, but let's step back and 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 take Bruce's question. When you were drag racing, was it front or rear wheel drive? And uh, if front wheel drive, how did you hone in on the, and I'm pretty confident on the front wheel drive part because what you told me, right? But the, uh, 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 how did you hone in on traction and weight transfer? You Were you a chassis guy and trying to, you, front wheel drive getting bite on the international cars is a, is a bit of a problem, right? Well, personally, rear wheel drive. Ah, there you go. There you go. So, you go. so that, that personally, that was my thing. Um, Cause uh, I had a Nissan 240 before that I had a Toyota pickup that I had with, nitrous and a turbo and everything else so that was rear wheel drive all the way through um and that was just basically like standard weight transfer stuff like you would do on any other rear wheel drive drag car um more complex drive, than a lot of more complex than a lot of people think but uh very effective right right uh front wheel drive wise i mean uh that's more of the conversations i've had with people like ron bergenholtz and a few other ones that basically invented the uh wheelie bars but they put them on front wheel drive cars and it makes to, it to, oddly, you know to keep it deal. keep it from transferring and unloading the front tires um but yeah i don't really have too much experience personally with the trash control on the front wheel drives i have uh, not, not in a negative way trash control but uh, controlling the traction you know um, right, 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 right. okay <laughs> right. <laughs> which brings yeah. us to the next question actually uh -huh. that we have here uh, andy is uh uh, he says it in a way that uh, I thought traction control was anything uh, traction control and anything that appeared to be traction control related was banned in formula drift. Let's uh, leave that question on there for a second, guys. What, uh, where does uh, formula drift stand with, with traction control? What is the thoughts on that? Uh, traction control is, is not allowed. So, and, it, and is it something that, um, gosh, it, how helpful would it be in your sport? Is there, a, is there a way it could be used to really make the competitor much better, only letting, you know, 80% uh, wheel spin versus 110? Uh, well, would it be effective if it was allowed? Yes. Okay. <laughs> but, I mean, but that's one of those things that it, that involves more money and more engineering. To, to make so, it work correctly for this, this form of motorsport. Right. So that's kind of the thing that I was, we were trying to get away from. If you're a guy coming out of the Pro-Am series and you're coming into our Pro Spec series and you have you and two of your friends on your team, you're not going to beat the guy that has an engineer that's designing his wheel speed based off track position 
and everything else all the way around. That guy's going to pull bus lengths on you and you're done, you know? Um, so that's kind of the idea behind it is to make the driver actually drive. But you have to have, it would be interesting. It's a, it's an interesting engineering experience if I was on that end of it, because in road racing, let's say you, you want to have, um, you know, 5% um, tire spin maximum grip acceleration straight line acceleration and you in in drifting there is uh, there would be some needed right and uh, and there would be a time when you'd want more and less depending on uh, some different things so it would be uh, it would be very expensive to do correctly for your former motorsports no doubt in my mind at least right and the thing is is i mean it's basically a competition of precision driving yeah so if you're having the computer give you all of these aids that you know, oh, I added this much steering angle, so it knows I'm going to spin, so it pulls out power, and then it does this, and it's doing all this, uh, you know, like force vectoring or correcting. Applying brakes on one side and not mm, the other. You know, yeah. that's fine when you're in the snow driving too fast and you're trying not to kill yourself, but that's not really the point of this. You yeah, know, it's, yeah. this it's competition. supposed to be, yeah. right, precision driving. Yeah. So when- wheel speed sensors are out, steering sing- angle sensors are out, uh, drive shaft speed all those sensors are not allowed to try to reduce the inputs of things you can do without this. So a couple of things, it makes it easier for you as a, a number one, it, it basically is telling the competitors don't even try. And we're taking away bo- most of the tools that allow you to do it fairly easily. And then it makes it easier for you to check, right? So if you're with the ECU connection that you've got and the data that uh, that we have right here is the same way I've got the data in live data, maybe we'll bring it up, but the, uh, the, uh, you do have a pedal position and you have the throttle body, which you mentioned earlier. One of the things you check real quickly is the driver's asking for X. And if the, and if the throttle body is not seeing that we've, uh, we we're going to dig in much deeper, very quickly. Right. <laughs> right. Cause you're allowed to put over. A, right. You're allowed to put a curve in it. So the curve is different, but if it better sometimes be consistent. you're right, exactly. As long as it's repeatable, then we're, we're on the same page. Perfect. The um, uh, uh, you did mention steering angles. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about that. Uh, Andy went on to mention that uh, steering wheel sensors. When I got this data, I thought, well, that would be kind of cool to look at and bring up and show the folks the steering wheel because uh, these cars, what uh, it's not allowed, but um, uh, approximately what degree of uh, angle can these cars turn with their with their front wheels across the board? And they're all different, I'm sure, a little bit, but what kind of big numbers? I mean, it's nearing 90, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, for actual wheel angle, you're probably, I mean, at minimum 65, mm-hmm. probably most people are 70-ish, but I mean, yeah, if you have like 55 degrees of angle, you don't have enough. You're probably in trouble, huh? Because you 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 need the extra angle to save yourself sometimes if you throw it deep, and if you just don't have enough you can't bring it across. You can't be, but, you can't be doing the act of precision driving as, as well as you ought to be. Right. Yeah. Right. But that, that we've had a lot of, you know, Ackerman designs, mm. uh, camber caster relationships, everything else that have changed over the years to make it go faster sideways and, you know, change the dynamics of how the vehicles work. Interesting. So that's all a constant development, but that's also basically free game in our sport. Very good. And you, and you notice that in all forms of motorsports and, and when it, when this, when drift was young, it probably was just barely modified production cars. And you see these things where a team gets in there and some, uh, all forms of motorsports have smart people and they, uh, we want to do that. Well, what, what could we do what's in the, within the rules to make it do that better? And, I, and I see just from the outside, looking at video and pictures, slow motion, I see very, very odd things happening in the front uh, geometry that, uh, that obviously is helpful, but I, I don't understand fully, obviously, but I see things happening that I go, oh, oh wow, they're really worked up there. Interesting. Yep. <laughs> uh, and then tires. Tires is a big thing, right? And uh, the uh, uh, they go through a lot of tires, obviously the smoke, which is just uh, fantastic for the crowd and and uh, part of the show and, and part of the, the entire program. Um, we, 
I, in my mind, I always think of, well, you know, uh, this is, this is 19, you know, uh, 1990s and drifting, I suppose, was if I didn't have enough power, a little harder tire, you know, we, we're drifting, we just throw it sideways and we have some fun, right? But the, uh, it is so much more technical than that now. They're going to super soft tires because you have to stay with the other guy. What is the, uh, what is the theory on tires? And, and they're changing them a lot. Uh, what is a good tire versus a bad tire? I mean, basically, if, if you're into uh, like the 200 treadwear type road racing tires or autocross tires, that's basically what we use also. Mm -hmm. So trying to get it something that's a tire that's relatable to someone, but has basically the most amount of grip possible that's legal on the street. So tire they're all DOT. Tire, yeah, tire and, manufacturers deeply involved in your sport. So it's important to have a, a tire that's available to their to their their users. Right. Cause I mean, each, each team probably go, well, each car probably goes through between 30 and 40 tires a weekend. Think about that, everybody. <laughs> Think right. about that. And, and why, uh, obviously you're spinning them and you're going sideways, but yet you still have to have grip. A grip is such an important part of your, of your sport. Why, why is that? What, uh, what are they trying to accomplish with that going side? And then they need the grip when they need to go. Right. Because you don't necessarily want to go slow through through the course because since it's two cars on track at the same time sorry with my hand motions here That's okay. um one leads one follows and then they switch so if there's a big gap between the lead car and the follow car like if the follow car can't keep up at any point you're at a disadvantage so Score, scoring wise though by, right scoring wise yeah. in the in the eyes of the judges yeah so you want to be as close to each other as possible that's the excitement and the factor of drifting which is why that other map exists because those are the areas you're allowed to slow down so if you are doing brake checking basically okay in you those really other areas the guy behind yeah now you also lose okay. so yeah. that that's a that's why that's a judging tool sort of but um, so, yeah, so you want as much grip as possible. You don't want to be on a 500 treadwear, $49 tire because one, they'll probably explode <laughs> at those wheel speeds. They'll probably just come apart. Yeah. So you need a high quality tire to have it hook up. And I mean, we could bring up some of the G's in the live data, but on this car in particular with its weight and everything else, I'd probably guess it's 0 0.8, 0 0.85 G's most of the time um still and, very uh, high while while at a, at a huge uh, yaw angle right huge those are big numbers right. actually so if you're if you're pulling pretty decent numbers like that you know and you and you're making tire smoke and you're going you know 60 miles an hour sideways right by the wall you got a lot of grip cranked in the car yeah yeah okay and what 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 approximate horsepower numbers are are, are some of these cars what are you hearing for approximate horsepower I mean, at minimum, I would say probably 850 wheel. <laughs> um, we have a lot of cars that have done 1400 wheel, but it just depends on the course. Like the course we have in this example here is a small radius, but a, a steeper angle banking. But on the infield, there's not enough grip. So if, if you tried to run 1400 on it, there'd be no point. You'd probably and, and, be better off running 800. And you can see that here where you get, where the car is getting to that infield piece you're talking about. He is no longer, he's close, but he's no longer at full throttle, right? It, he's having to manage it at, at some level. Right. So there's, so that one, there's, there's, there's room to spare. Either you could put more grip into it or take more power out to yeah. fix the balance a little bit. But that's the odd thing about our sport too, is if you build all the grip into the bank, then you get to the infield and now it either drives terrible. You have to get the balance right ah. between those two different track situations Interesting. because you're not, you know, it, it, it makes it a little bit more complicated. It's another variable to deal with. And you always turn left and right, which makes it that they can't set the cars up that way. So they've got to be, uh, you know, more or less balanced that way, which is good. Right. Uh, I bring up the horsepower and looking at the throttle trace. And if you think of a car that has either near or at four digits of horsepower to at the rear wheels and, and, and he's hammered down. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and th so there's a lot of grip in the tires and they're, and they're pulling down uh, with, with a lot of grip, you know, the car, you know, there's a lot of power being uh, put out of the car at this point. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's a lot of 
time at one period to yeah. be wide open with that yeah. much power you yeah, know it, it is bringing up the rpm the speed is coming down which means that the tire speed is coming up and it's rotated and and, and right. all that stuff is happening right so and and not going straight which is another another mind-bending thing you can visualize you know 800 horsepower driving straight down the drag strip but 800 a thousand horsepower sideways through a turn next to a wall is another level you know yeah you're having to manipulate the car and put it exactly where you want and then you guys are scoring on how close is that rear bumper to that clipping point and then on the other side when on the tight corner how close is that front bumper and at the whole time the driver is also it's a dual run right so they're it's all about staying right with them and they're swapping directions and the the nose is going from the the driver's the passenger side door on one way and then they rotate back and come right back and the nose is up at the driver's side door it's a it's an interesting uh experience to watch because the you you think of it uh you go there and i don't didn't have a whole lot of preconceived notions but uh the skill involved the, the, the cars are, are just totally badass but the with the noise and the the power and the you know um, the the paint jobs the schemes and you know everything's going on clearly a, a lot of effort and time and money has been putting in it and then they get out there and the drivers uh, are, 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 are truly amazing there. They are, uh, what they do, they do very, very well. So it's, it's fun to watch, which makes your scoring a little harder. Cause it's, a uh, you know, there's a lot of good ones, right. When, uh, maybe the round, when they first show up, the, the, the guy who's just learning, there's a difference between them. Right. But when you get up to that top, you know, maybe 16 or something, I, no reason for you to say it, but the, you, the, the competition gets very, very tight. And now it's the, the adjustments, the data that they're working with, things like that is, is interesting. Right. The, the higher you get up to the top, the more you're splitting hairs to try to figure out what to do with your competitor. And I saw one of the questions in the chat. Um, yes, the two cars are not on the same team. They're they're competing against each other. So they one leads and then they follow and they switch. So then they judge the both leads versus the both chases. And then basically the overall and that's how they determine a winner. Perfect. And there's actually two the runs. Next. There's actually two right. runs in, in each round for a car because one one lead, one fall entry. I forgot that we should, should have probably mentioned that. Right. Um, so that's when the tires get changed too. Is you run your your two, your your one lead and your one follow, then you change your rear tires. Fronts will usually last the the whole competition pretty much. Okay. But, well, that was a question there is do the front tires get rotated to the rear, but they're probably different sizes, maybe. Oh yeah. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Huge yeah. big big rack big rear tires, obviously. Right. Okay. Uh any rules with regard to steering ratios? Can they can they change that piece? Uh, obviously you don't allow steering sensors, but can you go to a you know one turn lock to lock kind of a thing? Is that what they're doing? Um for the most part they don't. Oh, okay. um the reason why if you put in the actual steering quickener we tried this years ago with actually with uh a, a few that i don't want i won't mention any names okay <laughs> so <laughs> almost we got tried you, didn't, it, we? didn't we <laughs> but uh the the problem is is it reduces the feedback on the wheel ah. so if you bring it across and now you have that extra set of gearing in there obviously you can control it where it's going but with so much wheel angle you don't really have the sensation anymore. Interesting. The feedback so, through the wheel. So you don't, uh, you, you, it's hard to keep it exactly where you'd like it. Right. And we're already running different, you know, power steering pumps and, you know, bypasses are different. Everything else is different because there's so much load on the steering rack. You put that other device in there. Now you kind of have no idea. You can't feel a damn thing. It's like driving a big off-road truck Yeah. with the big hydraulic steering. There's yeah. really not the same sensation there. So, um, yeah, I, when I, I raced off road in the buggies and, and I, I was dry, I was a driver at the time they went from manual steering to power steering and that was a uh, it was a year year and a half that all the the, the high end power steering manufacturers were working on is try to give the driver some feel back because they're immediately it felt like an electric motor right they're like nothing you almost had to have a view of your front tires occasionally right you were getting nothing which was kind of nice you, I was done with blisters at least but the uh, <laughs> but then you can't drive the car very well and then they they ended up with a, a way to do it with racks and with, with some of the hydraulic rams and stuff they were doing to 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 feed to get feedback in a normal way, but not to kill the driver's hands and such. So, right. interesting. If you would like, I'd I'd love to jump into some live data and maybe have you take a look at it. And we've got uh, maybe another five minutes or so where we can uh, chat, take a look at this, see if anybody has any questions. Real quickly, let me figure out how to do this. New share and this one. 
here is some live data from from Orlando, and um, th these are the channels we had, and we can see. I, I didn't the, the picture. The reason I wanted to go to live data as much as anything is we actually weren't seeing the whole track and what I had captured. So, you uh, you're starting here. Let's put the cursor where where it is. The data works the same in in this as it does with with all the rest of us, right? And um, uh, so you start, and they take off. They go through the gears, and uh, and and the you can see where they. Uh, they back feed it, they start to go the other way, and then they pitch it hard going into the corner, right? So right. the car is actually, we're still going straight, and the driver has has thrown a lot of yaw at it before he even gets to the corner in this particular Right, case. so there's probably 40, 45 degrees of angle in the car already mm -hmm. as right there as he did his flick and then threw it back into the course to set himself up for the bank and getting lined up. And here's that difference of of what you're fighting and trying to trying to fine tune and get where we can get something good for you. But 65 degrees is not 65 degrees of of angle. It's it's the degrees per second. It's the speed of the rotation. It's not right. how much rotation has happened. So degrees per second, 65 degrees. So the, right here is where he peaked in his rotation. Even though this number is coming down, the car is still probably rotating and, and getting itself set for the corner. So kind of interesting. And you can see where he has uh, allowed himself to, to jump off the, the throttle for whatever reason to maybe he was the follow car and has to get himself put in the right place or something, right? I would guess on this one that this is a lead pass. Okay. Based on uh, based on how the it looks the like he's running through the chicane. No, right here on the on, on the actual track map. You see how there's mm -hmm. a little kink oh, on right, the start. Right back in there. Uh, all the way at the blue. All the way at the beginning. Oh, okay. See, there's there's a little there's a little wobble there coming right off the start. Okay. Right. I run a very small chicane um, for our start to basically get the cars to enter the first turn together. Yeah. Uh, so okay. you can see it there. So there's a little kink there. So that is probably a lead run. So he probably started on the right. Have to do that. And and he pulled up in front of the other car and they were off and run. So the lead right. car always starts um, in that chicane and comes up in front and goes. Okay. Right. Yeah, so that, the other one will develop a map trace that's basically straight, straight through that, that section. Um, so see how much you've been using data to uh, to uh, to do that. That's interesting. Yep. So <laughs> so yeah. So as they go through that, I would guess on his lead run, that lift of the throttle is to back the car up a little bit and get it closer to the wall with okay. the back bumper. Okay. So. Okay, so that's actually, oh, no, that's a handbrake. So that one right there is a lift and a handbrake as the rotation was going. Okay. Okay. So he probably clutched in, rotated the car real quick, then hopped back on throttle to run it from there. And interesting, how, and, and, and probably so, because look, the RPM is still driving, even though he's there, which means the car is really in yaw, right? It was pulling down a little bit, had to kind of spool up and, and get the tires really, really, really spinning, starting from about there. Right. Hmm, interesting. Okay. And, and then he supercharged, then, so it pulled up pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> no problem coming off the bottom, right? The uh, and then here you can see where he's just holding the the yaw angle, I suppose, a little bit with the right foot and the steering wheel. And uh, but uh, the I don't know. Uh, oh, we probably can do it here real quickly if I uh, if I want to do it. If we come from here, and we go to here where he's lifted it towards the end of that middle of that corner. You know the uh, the average pedal position here was uh, was was ninety three and a point five percent with a with a, a almost four digit horsepower car at the rear wheels. That's a he was nearly full throttle right for for the entire for that entire piece there of uh, of nine point seven seconds seven hundred fifty seven feet. So in, interesting to see. Right. So I mean, if if that was a a thousand horsepower drag car you would be done with the quarter mile. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you, that's a long time to be digging in the, you know, in, with that type of power. Yeah. And, and even when I backed out to the full lap and, and uh, I don't know exactly, it's clearly it's close to where the finish line because he was still throttling up. But even right. with the low uh, our, uh, throttle position at first, we're talking 85% of, of average throttle for the entire run. So pre pre pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Anything, and then the the driver as they as they come in here and they're transitioning in this particular track, we didn't have the map for this one, but would there be a, a, a this would be a up high all the way and it would be high all the way here? Or was it, was this one small enough that they actually did have an inside clipping point? Um, there's an right past where your cursor is now. If you uh, go probably right around in that region, is actually probably a little bit further than that. 
Um, there, there's a big drop you're, right here. In right. The throttle. So you, so you come off the banking and then there's an inner clip there okay. that you get. Then you transition across the straight section there to another inner clip. And then the last turn is a flat. There's no banking. Uh, okay. So that's a, a tighter radius, but it's flat. And the other banking joins there. So usually they'll put the back corner tire on that gap. Okay. So they get a curbing basically. So then they dig into that curb and they ride that curb all the way around. So it's and not I mean, only, you can see like the radius is practically perfect. Yeah, you know? in this particular driver's case, it is. It's a little bit smaller than than where he was at here. This tightened up a little bit, but a little bit smaller. And the bigger point is the difference between banking and flat right there. He dropped a gear and instead of running it in fifth gear, he went to fourth and it didn't have the, the banking to help him all, all on top of it. Right. So you can see the difference in the way that he drove it. Right. That's why I like using your guys' corner radius formulas is you can ah. bring that in and then you can see that also in here. Interesting. I did not bring that up, but so I can't show it, but that, that uh, you can see it visually, but it's uh, nice to have a hard number. And I have found that calculation to be, to be amazingly good. Uh, uh, many times of different ways of checking it, I have found that to be very good. We have, and I continue to get a lot of requests for it. We have a, a, uh, a GPS based or sensor based or both a uh, set of math channels that we, uh, that I send out for, uh, for free to anybody that wants them, just email me. We'll, we'll get back to the presentation in just a moment at the end and, uh, and happy to, uh, to send that out. If anybody sends me an email, Hey, Roger, send me the math channels you talked about at the webinar. I, I I've got a, a thing set up to ship them right out to you. So that's uh, perfect. Is left foot braking uh, used? They typically are driving with two feet and one foot on, on the brake to, to, to be ready for things. Uh, left foot braking is very common just to keep the vehicle stable, settle, but like you would down. in other yeah. road racing things, kind of, you know, keep the transition down and keep the grip loaded up. Um, so a lot of people do left foot brake. Well, the, as they've always said, you know, you, uh, you, you steer a car as much with your feet as you do with your hands when in, in a performance situation, right? So you're doing a lot of steering with your hands here, but you're, 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 we can see the driver is, uh, is, is get grabbing a little extra grip when he needs to by re releasing the throttle and of course, touching the brake a little bit. So interesting. Interesting. Anything else you'd like to add there before we kind of, uh, jump out and start going through, uh, you know, trying to close this one down. Any other questions in the, in the group would be, uh, would be good at this point as well. And what about video? Do you do you tie? Uh, do, are the users uh, obviously? There's a lot of video. It's a it's a social media uh, enterprise as well. Obviously, is uh, everybody have video in their cars? Um, a lot of people do run in car cameras, but uh, as a series, we're not running in car cameras or smarty cams or anything that's tied to the data as of yet. Um, because in my opinion, since the sport is judged externally, and all the fans are watching it from the outside you know, just like any other type of event, you're doing it from the outside. What they're doing inside, if you have to move your hands 17 times or kick your feet around a whole bunch, doesn't matter. Yeah, not to you. It, right, it's the, <laughs> it's the presentation on the outside. So that's you're kind of my, my, my personal take on it. So I would rather have our outside video from our live stream cameras and our TV cameras overlaid with a data overlay. Okay. okay. I think that would be the most powerful to get to at some point in time. Let, let, let's kind of close it out with that. Ray Studio 2 is what we looked at. We're, we're working with you um, to, uh, to fine tune a formula drift area, uh, some special tasks that it may do to help you in, in, in your world um, with doing data analysis and data com comparisons and some other things. What, um, what do you see as the, as the future of, uh, uh, of where we're going with data in your sport with, with aim solos or, or other devices. Well, I mean, ideally if I could do a live telemetry of a few channels, you know, you do GPS speed, um, G's maybe throttle or RPM. And you did that as an overlay to our outside cameras and to our feed for live stream and to the judges. So everyone's kind of on the same page of what could be going on. I think that would be a whole nother level of integrating fans and bringing people and data and stuff into the sport. Well, the new, uh, the, the, the new smarty cams, as we just, uh, 
we we were at the PRI show and had some uh, uh, a new Smarty Cam three product that we that we we shown showed a lot of people and uh, there are some levels of those do have a a video out and then that of course will be able to be synced in the in Ray Studio three and uh, the the question for you and something we haven't worked on and certainly don't have anything that's uh, imminent at all but uh, getting that data and that video in real time into either your hands or of course the the, the judge's hands and eventually probably, uh, you know, an app or something for, for, uh, for the folks watching, you know, and either in the stands or at, you know, at home. So that, uh, that would be interesting stuff and make, uh, and, and really revolutionize your sport and make it even more interactive, which would be cool. Yep. That's a whole nother level. Perfect. Perfect. Let me jump back to, let me share and jump back to the, uh, the document here. Uh, the, we, we've all learned a lot, right? I, I think, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you were here and you were able to chat with us and show us some of the things that, uh, that you do with the data that uh, many of our folks that are watching this uh, you know, live here with us or later on YouTube are using data in many different ways, whether it be off-road or, or sports cars or motorcycles or drag, you know, all the different ways that people use, uh, use our data. You are one of uh, them and, and the competitors obviously as well. And uh, so it's pretty cool that you were able to come in and, and, and explain some of that to us. And uh, what I find even most intriguing, and I hope everybody understands it well, Kevin's been here for 50% of our webinars, right? And, um, and he's learning, he sees something and something we do with these in, uh, on a cart and, it, and, it, and a light bulb goes on and says, well, maybe I can use that in, in my form of sports. And I think it goes the other way, certainly for everybody as well. We're seeing things you know, you maybe you race a sports car and you see something that somebody's talking about on a, on a cart or an off-road truck or a UTV. And you know what, how do I adapt that to do what I want to do? And Kevin's done a lot of that in his data. And I, I think that's pretty cool that there, he's got his head down and he's learning. He's been to some of our uh, on-site uh, seminars before, before the pandemic. And, and he's, uh, he's always out there learning. And I think that's, uh, that's just wonderful. It's gonna, and it proves good things are coming for the, for the drift series. So appreciate that very much. The, um, we're going to kind of tidy this one up. We're, we're recording this, and when we get it all done, we'll put it up on our on our YouTube site. The um, um, this will be number 188 video up there. Where we've had all of our webinars through 2021, and and coming in 22, we'll all be there. Plus, there's a bunch of other web uh, other videos that are up there with with great information. So um, uh, watch some of those. Go back, do some search. I've tried to put in the keywords and and in the description good things about each of these webinars so if you go to youtube there's a little search box there and if you type in drift right you're going to find when we've ever mentioned drift or you you're going to find you know a carding or you know solo or whatever it happens to be the the, the function there works pretty good we've got a lot of a lot of information up there a lot of videos so i know it's a little hard to find but that search box in youtube actually works fairly well so so uh keep that in mind as you're searching for uh for for this video or for other ones so uh, customer support, boy, did we, uh, we had the entire AIM crew was pretty much, uh, uh, almost everybody was pretty much in uh, PRI in Indianapolis over the last weekend, had a great time with everybody. Uh, we're right back on the road and, uh, and, and, and we should see you at tracks all over the place. If you don't see us with our support vans or uh, the other things, give us a call 800-718-9090. Um, we're, we're, out, we're out here to make sure that you get the best bang for your buck out of your, uh, out of your data system and love to help you. And, uh, you know, um, and, and we are available at, uh, at almost all times. So what are we going to have for our next webinar? I do not know. So we're a, we're a couple of, uh, you know, three weeks away or so before we do our next one to be determined. The, um, uh, as I asked earlier, uh, uh, before we started to record and I'll ask it again here, please give me some, uh, give me some feedback. Uh, I'll have a, uh, uh, email address on the next slide, but we will be doing webinars. The next one will be on January 4th. We're starting to fill that schedule and, and get, uh, get co-hosts to come in with us. Uh, I see some, uh, some suggestions in the chat right now, uh, continue to put them there. I do review all of the chats in the Q&A and, uh, and also send me emails, I would love it. But we will be doing these. You'll see a, uh, uh, an extension email for anybody that is uh, already uh, signed on for these. We'll use the same login information, the same uh, webinar number, and we will just uh, keep extending the, uh, uh, the series as long as people are interested. So keep, keep that in mind and uh, uh, you'll see, you'll get some emails from us. So the, uh, some contact information with, uh, 
for Kevin is uh, Kevin is the Kevin at formula at D dot com pretty uh, pretty straightforward uh there's my information uh roger at .com. i mentioned that uh, you could drop me a note giving me some suggestions on on future webinars and if you're interested in the math channel formula uh, file that's importable into ray studio 2 uh, i've got a, a big file including all the documentation on it uh, excel spreadsheets of exactly all, all the settings and where you can cut and paste them in yourself if you don't want to import them whatever it works for you we've, uh, we've got the whole thing for you so drop me a note and uh, and we will put that together kevin thank you so much for coming i've uh, uh, we've wanted to do this for a while i know and we've chatted about it and uh, and and, and the, the stars have finally aligned and we were able to get you here and it was very very interesting thank you for coming is there anything else that you'd like to kind of add as we uh, as we end this no, I just wanted to say thank you for having me, and uh, I appreciate it. The webinars have been an awesome learning experience, and uh, it's very handy to have them so you can review them on YouTube uh, anytime you like. And so if you're very good, yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you being here. And uh, the uh, uh, if you're a, a competitor in Formula Drift, we uh, we have uh, AIM staff that attend almost all. I I believe almost all of the. Uh, uh, formula drift events so if you're a competitor and you've got our data loggers in there um, we're walking around make sure you get a hold of us and look for us if you have any questions or you, know, you need some parts or you need some help configuring something to work the way you want it look for our guys we're at the formula drift events as well so thanks everybody for coming i appreciate it for our last uh, webinar of the of 2021 look forward to seeing everybody uh next year thanks for all of you that have been here live in the chat having a great time uh, uh, this has been something that's been been great. We created quite a community of folks that watch this live and then watch uh, and then another group that watches it uh, later on YouTube. So thanks everybody for coming. I appreciate it. We will see you all in, uh, in next year. Talk to you soon.